series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? Well, um, I don't think it's an original uh, reference, but for me, it was Eraserhead. I was a pre-law econ major in college, and I was I didn't have a lot of money, so I was working my way through school, and one of my jobs was being a concessions person at the, the ASSU Sunday Flicks, which was the movie series that ran on Sunday nights at a big auditorium. It was a cool place and a cool screen. But along in there somewhere, I went to the new Varsity Cinema in Palo Alto and saw Eraserhead and then booked it for, for the series because I just was overwhelmed by it, totally disturbed and um, just uh, discombobulated by it because it was so, in some ways, kind of, um, by the end, it's very uh, gory and almost revolting, you know? And it's like, my son talks about it. He, my son's a, a kind of expert in horror films and is a aficionado. He says, the abject, dead, the abject, accepting the abject, which is, you know, the expulsion of like bodily fluids and like the, the abject horror of things is the way to spiritual healing. <laughs> and I was like, what? What are you talking about? And then I just rewatched Eraserhead, and I, I see what he means is that that film to me was the first time I'd ever seen a film capture a psychological reality, a, a subjective reality where the, the camera is not just a mind's eye view, but a subconscious eye view of shame and self loathing and uh, horrific awareness of your own, of your body and, and your. You know, I didn't even know what it was that it was so much about fear of replication at the time, fear of having kids. And so I didn't face that till till later. But you know, when I when I did have kids and we thought about having kids, I, I really connected to it as an anxiety dream about uh, a sort of fear of replicating all that's dysfunctional about you and all that's like, why would I want to replicate this? And it's all the details that that got me the. The editing style, for example, I was thinking about of just holding in shots, like hit the button on an elevator and just stand there and stand there. And there's no cut. You, know, you keep going, cut, there's gotta be, just still standing there. There's another shot, which I used to quote with my friends back then where his wife says, I'm leaving you, you know, and she reaches under the bed and grabs, a, well, you don't know what she's grabbing. She just yanks and yanks and yanks and yanks. And she yanks like 23 times. And he's just in the bed going, oh, oh, and it just goes on forever. And it's kind of a combination of an, ang an anxious state and an anxiety dream thing. And also what we, what I later started to learn to be called comedy torture. Cause you, you think it's going to, it's funny at first and then, oh, now it's not funny anymore. I'm so sort of sick of this. And then it gets funny again because you're still stuck in it and you don't, you realize it's not going to end. And then. You know, and I, we used that a lot later on in some of the comedies I did. It definitely played into how I approached a film like Meet the Parents, especially, for example. I mean, the, the Meet the Parents dinner scenes uh, are definitely inspired by the weird dinner scenes with the, the weird little chickens and the, the way the father would just stare at him and the way the mom would, you know, sort of accuse him of some sort of perversion. Like the whole thing just, it, it's, it, it felt so true you know and so accurate to another kind of reality that i just hadn't seen portrayed maybe in bunuel films or surrealist paintings or something but i just had never seen anything quite like it i just saw the ari aster movie uh Bo is afraid and you can see, you can for sure track the david lynch influences in that film so i think it haunts a lot of people i don't that's what i mean i don't think it's an original reference i don't think it's a unique reference but it's a pivot, it was a pivotal moment and I didn't apply to law school and I start, I made a film that summer and then I applied to USC and, uh, you know, completely changed my trajectory. I think partly based on, partly or largely based on the race of it. And I have to imagine that that great scene in the first Austin Powers when Mike Myers is getting that little uh, golf cart thing and he's going back and forth and he's trying to back up and turn around and it 
I, I think that probably takes about a minute and just laugh out loud funny. All that comes directly from a racer head, doesn't it? Uh, it's definitely inspired that those, again, sort of extending those moments. And it, it actually, uh, Alexander Payne worked on a, a draft of Meet the Parents. And he sort of reminded me, you know, because we were getting a lot of pressure and previews to, to make Meet the Parents go fast. I think it's about an hour and 55 minutes, which was long for a comedy like that. But he said, you know, you, you, these awkward moments when you're just, I was thinking about that moment when, uh, when, when um, De Niro and and Greg Fokker and and uh, played by Ben and um, Owen Wilson's character Bevan are standing around and and uh, De Niro said, "Oh, Greg's Jewish," you know. And then there's this long awkward beat, and then oh, and, and Owen says, "Oh, so is JC. You're in good company." And the awkwardness of those moments to just hold in the the painful, you know, awareness of when he's first. You know, how do you spell Fokker? You know, like there's just, there were times when you could have cut and you would have cut normally for comic timing, but to hold and then hold and hold and just uh, let the audience share the same discomfort, actual go go for discomfort. You know, don't, don't make it light and easy just because it's fun and funny. Pain in that situation is funny. Watching a person cope with their own self-loathing and, fear of not being, you know, accepted in those situations. That was definitely inspired by David Lynch, no question. Well now, so as you were finding your voice as a filmmaker, what movie or series did you watch and you thought it was so good that it made you question, boy, should I really be playing in this sandbox? Can I do this? <laughs> oh man, there's so many, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of later on, I mean, David O. Russell's films, are, I, Flirting with Disaster was one I, oh, and 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 the Farrelly Brothers, you know, once I started doing comedy, uh, when I saw something about Mary, I just wanted to retire and like, I can't, I don't know how to be that funny. You know, those, those there were films like that where you kind of go, that's just extraordinary. Comedy, comedy for me is so hard, much harder, I think, than a lot of other things. And so I, you know, I, I, yeah, I sort of always, I'm sort of stopped by those really great things. When I, when I was younger, a series I was thinking of that inspired me a great deal was All in the Family. I just can't, I, I can't describe how much that series uh, got into my head because I didn't, my dad was very conservative. I was the meathead of my own family. <laughs> and, and also politics, I, a lot of my, what became my interest later in political films came out of arguing with my dad about politics and sort of being inspired by the arguments that, uh, and my dad thought, you know, I may, for some people, this is, this is true, but for him, Archie Bunker was a hero. <laughs> for me, he was a comedic buffoon, you know, a delusional, you know, uh, politically ignorant, vaguely bigoted person. That storytelling could be therapeutic for the artist, for the person who is, that you could have family therapy out of, you know, all the family and have uh, some sort of dark shadow side, um, you know, subconscious therapy from a film. It meant that I could explore things that I could grow from. I can remember a conversation we had when you were squarely in the comedy mode and you were telling me about your interest in politics. For some reason, I thought you were gonna shout out all the president's men. That was a huge inspiration. It was so funny that I got to work with Dustin later and got to know Carl Bernstein a little bit. But that film is, I have a poster of it right inside of my dining room here because it did make me, it made me aware that you could get people to care about politics in a, a sort of entertaining thrillery way. I mean, that was a that was a real thriller, and you could raise questions about how then shall we as a civilization move forward in an in a I don't know beautifully filmed, beautifully acted, sometimes you know absurd and ironic uh, way. And it, it, it when I got into the political sphere of things, that's a film I just watch you know, every every six months or so. How many films are there that become popular that aren't anti-hero films? Those two guys 
are heroes because they care, you know? And that's actually, you know, to, Ki to Kill a Mockingbird is another one that I always quote for that. Like to have stories about people who aren't cynical, who aren't sort of always sort of undercutting themselves for fear of being too too preachy. They, they had an edge and they had a, a kind of, they weren't saints, they, but they were truly heroic, you know, like in the best sense of heroic. And I've looked for that point of view character in every one of the political films and in Bombshell, in Margot's character, you know, the character who's, who really cares, but is gonna, you know, is gonna make mistakes along the way and is still really compelling but aren't anti-heroes. They're actually genuine heroes. And uh, that's, it's really hard to find those stories. I, and I, I, they always inspired me and uh, I, I keep looking for more of them. I'm hoping you'll indulge me and talk a little bit about, you know, how you sort of came out of nowhere and, and, and got the job directing the first Austin Powers movie and obviously then um, the sequels. But, you know, the question is whether it was a work of yours or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you could do this, that you could belong? And in this case, as a comedy director, as a director of big hit comedies, um, where you helped someone like a genius like Mike channel his gifts in such an effective way. I'm so glad you tied that question to, to Mike because Mike is the one, along with the Todd sisters, so I always want to be sure to credit Jennifer Todd and Suzanne Todd, who, who helped get me that gig. But Mike, uh, we, we knew each other, Susanna and his wife Robin knew each other, and we, we shared, you know, influences and references, and he's, he, I, we, I talked about Monty Python and some old Woody Allen films and, uh, you know, the monkeys or whatever. But I had also talked to him about history. He was really interested in World War II history. Anyway, he said, look, why don't you take a read of this script? And I did and gave him some notes, you know, that I thought just reminded me of this and what about that? And he read these notes and he said, will you help me look for a director? And I was actually busy helping him comb through commercial reels and uh, you know, director reels, and I had actually found uh, someone that I thought would be good. And he said, well, I've actually put you up for the job. And then I found out the Todd sisters and Susanna, my wife, had all conspired with Mike to put me up for the gig. <laughs> and I didn't know I was, I, and I was like, I'm not, when I found out, I was like, I'm not, why, you know, why do you think I would be able to do that? And he said, I don't know. I just, those, these notes really, really took me. I think you really get it. So I had to go through a bunch of hoops and go in and song and dance for, for executives. And Bob Shea at New Line, I remember saying at a table of like 15 people, like, who are you? We're not just going to hire Mike's buddy. And somehow, uh, and I said, ah, Mr. Shea, I totally agree with you. Here's some storyboards. And I had storyboarded out a whole Fembot sequence or something. And I got him laughing, but they still were so reluctant. And Mike just said, eventually just said, don't call me anymore until this is the guy directing it. And he was, you know, he was, he had, he had a strong background, but he wasn't, you know, he, that was a bold choice for where he was. And he held out and they were sending him other big name directors. And he finally called me and I could hear dogs barking and splashing. And he was shouting at the top of the, you, you, you got the job, you got the job. And he had jumped into the swimming pool with all his clothes on and he just, had some faith and and you know i still look at it as a kind of an insane place to die, the hill to die on <laughs> it was i'm gonna get this guy that job and he did and again the todd sisters really backed him up and mike deluca fought for me to get it and uh, but i don't yeah so but but winning his approval having him somehow sense that I would be good at helping stage the physical comedy, helping cast it, or, you know, whatever else I was able to throw in. Most of it was just on the job training and code, code doing, you know, co directing it in a way with him because he knew so much about what he wanted to do with his character. But he did let me direct the movie and then let me, you know, do, do, uh, do two more of them. So uh, winning his approval changed my life. There's no question about that. I always ask you about this, but you know, is it, it has, has Austin Powers uh, time passed or is it possible we may see another one of those? 
You know, I always hold out hope. Um, it's entirely up to Mike. Uh, I've always said, I'm if he if he comes up with something he loves, you know, I'm there. And it does come up from time to time. But you know, we've been saying that for what is it now, twenty uh, one years. You know, so so, um, so I'm. If, yeah, I think rightly so. Mike has always felt if if we come up with something that is so almost transcends what we've done before it'll be worth it otherwise you know let let it lie it, it, it did its thing and it was such a such a blast you know what would you say was the big obstacle that you had to overcome to allow you to turn the projects that influenced you into your mm. own language as a filmmaker mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a challenging question because i i um you know i've 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 definitely, as you can tell by the, the way I talked about things like Eraser, I've definitely struggled with a, an anxiousness and uh, about the ability to pull it off. A kind of um, I don't know what the right word is, almost like a, a, a yeah, just a question of whether I would be able to, whether I have the instincts to do it. And and every every film I kind of get there when I'm shooting, but then I seem to forget. <laughs> I forget that I oh I can actually do this. By prep, I'm always a basket case again. And I, I was saying the other day, I, I don't remember a film that I wasn't trying to get out of about two weeks before I started shooting. And I, I was reading the Mike Nichols biography recently, and, and I'm like, oh, I'm I, look, I'm no Mike Nichols, but even Mike Nichols would have that instinct so often. And Sidney Pollack was a mentor of mine, uh, and he. I've read that he was often in that place, and maybe it's just a lot of directors. I mean, we—I don't get to talk to enough directors. You know, it's, it's, I'm always envious of actors who become directors because they, they meet a lot of directors and hear their anxieties. But I'm always terrified in prep and kind of crazy. You know, kind of like not. <laughs> and and but then somehow when I get into it, into once you're collaborating with great writers. Great writers, I've been so lucky, and I'll say this, you know, in the middle of a, a writer strike, I have depended on the best writers, and and would be nowhere without teaming up with them every step of the way. I always have them in prep, I always have them with me in in the shoot, obviously, in casting, in editing. I bring them in. My my writer is my my creative buddy, uh, you know, in even through post production and into marketing. I I want the writers with me, you know. So I've just been lucky to have them to and once you get into the shoot and you're you're there and, and it's like oh this is yeah some of this is working and you get to collaborate with these great actors it it dissipates <laughs> it never entirely goes away but it dissipates and i think i've just been there's a survivor's guilt element too because you think every single time it's going to be a disaster but somehow you know you work your way through you just stay down and focus on on the uh you know, on the moments and try to get, I remember that Sydney and Lumet quote, you just, you're just making a mosaic and every day you're working on a little tile and if the tile's okay and it falls into place with the rest of the film, the film might be okay too. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of what, what gets me through, but it's the, it's the collaboration and it's the collaboration with great, great, great people that I've been lucky enough to have. That's, I'm, I, I, I'm grat grateful for it every day. <clears throat> well, now, last question. So, what burned in you to want to uh, to want to join up um, with High Desert and work with Patricia and Matt Dillon? And uh, yeah, what what burned in you here? Well, that's a good question too. I got seven great scripts handed to me, and you know, I had Ben Stiller call. He was gonna. He's, he's a producer. He was gonna direct it at one point. I got the, the guys from Apple. Really cool people from Apple give me a, a call but Patricia calling me and talking through what she wanted to do with the character I just instantly was hooked I've always been a fan of hers talking about yeah you know I remember her in flirting with disaster all those years ago but I've seen so much of the rest of her stuff and the way she talked about the character as a very flawed very dysfunctional person who's a bit of a hustler and has been addicted to heroin and, and is now proud she's only addicted to methadone and, and that she um, 
is you know a, a, a kind of at, at night her, her day job is working as a, a can can girl in a saloon uh fake you know flying in on the chandelier and getting in fake shootouts and but but she gets kicked out of her house and when her mom dies and she's so she's so you know sad and just demoralized by it and her siblings turn against her and she says i know what i'll help solve a murder <laughs> that's how that's how i'll cope with it so that that again there's sort of connection to flawed characters who are doing the best they can uh but are probably deluding themselves you know i think she, I, i was thinking today she is a hustler but she kind of hustles herself she kind of she kind of gets herself through all the dysfunction and the and that being knocked down I, i i referred to her the other day as a kind of rock and roll lucy ricardo in the desert she's got a she's got a gap between between what she thinks she's capable of and what she's actually capable of and that gap is a very very good uh comedic engine but it's also the human condition you know we we don't know ourselves we don't we do the best we can and you just she's looking she's searching for a way to be useful to people she's buzzing around in her dune buggy all through the desert and just trying to be this kind of busy bee uh, of helpfulness um even as she herself is often completely falling apart and then you throw in Matt Dillon and Maruja Opia and you know Rupert Friend and Bernadette Peters and Christine Taylor, Kira O'Donnell, like all these cast members, Brad Garrett, like there's so many again great collaborators that um I knew it would and by the way it's not one of the ones I was trying to get out of at the last minute. <laughs> Just from that new chemistry, I actually said, "Oh, yeah, maybe I'll it sounds like fun." And they asked me to do one and then I said, "I actually like 4 and 5 episodes 4 and 5." but I like building up to those and mm, the, the 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 seventh one's good and they hadn't written the finale and I said um I I appreciate the offer to do the pilot do you mind if I do all eight <laughs> and, and so I kind of threw myself into uh directing all eight of the, the episodes of the first season this it's almost connects back to the eraser head thing the moments alone with Peggy's character which I wouldn't necessarily have had time for in a feature length the moments where she's sitting in her car just you know realizing her siblings have betrayed her she you know she doesn't know what's next she, she has a bench strapped on her roof that she was going to take that that's for her mother to you know who's passed away to her spirit to sit in and look out over a a desert vista i mean she's all alone and she's just sitting there listening to to music and and then decides to decides to take acid to cope with things but it's um those moments are what make the long form worth it